I started talking about testosterone replacement therapy about 10 years ago, and I wanted to put together a talk that would help my colleagues from start to finish go from someone who maybe never prescribed testosterone before to actually administering expert testosterone replacement therapy. Now, there are a few new slides in here from what are in the expert download from AMMG they provide for us, so maybe the, uh, the tapes would be a good idea. So what is testosterone replacement therapy? It's replacing testosterone to healthy levels, and healthy is very patient-specific. Now, I'm a, I'm a normal range kind of guy. Going above the top of normal range to me is called doing steroids. However, there are a couple different patient populations, the dreaded post finasteride syndrome and some type 2 diabetic patients, I think, probably need to go just a little bit up top of normal range. And testosterone replacement therapy sure is not the same as doing Viagra, but your guys will tell you for the first couple of weeks if all they do is follow their penis around. So how do you screen for hypogonadism? What are the symptoms? TAT syndrome. You know what that is, tired all the time? We're talking about fatigue, obviously. Used to syndrome. I used to work well in the evening, but now by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm all pooped out. And every man who's ever become successful will tell you it's what he's done after 6 p.m. that got him that way. My wife and I used to enjoy a vibrant sex life. Now we don't even talk about it anymore. I used to be able to hit the golf ball 40 yards further. I tell you what, I figure out how testosterone placement therapy can cure your hook or slice. I'll get back to you on that. Loss of muscle mass, which you lose in muscle, you gain in fat. Poor recovery, whether it's from a workout or mowing the yard. Pain and inflammation, testosterone attenuates the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are part and parcel of pain and inflammation. Irritability. I love it when the wives and girlfriends come in with a guy because when I ask him if he's irritable, I can look at her face for the true answer. Depression, sure he's weak, fatigued, impotent. What's not to be depressed about? Um, let's see, what's the next one? Oh, yeah. This ain't my first rodeo, folks. <laughs> Loss of libido and hand-in-hand -hand with uh, erectile dysfunction. So this is the Adam Questionnaire, which is a mix of new and late findings for hypogonadism. And while it's about 90% sensitive, it's only about 50% specific. I think a couple of pharmaceutical companies would have you drop these uh, tablets off at your office for you. So when I'll be back turns into oh my back, <laughs> it could be a, the man's testosterone is tanked. So initial lab work. I'll go through these individually. You notice I have DHEAS on there. That's one that I run. I put my thyroid panel on there for those who are interested. Total testosterone is all that's produced but it's more usually used to deny men testosterone replacement therapy that they indeed deserve. Free testosterone, everybody knows that it's only 1% one, one to 4% of the free testosterone floating around the bloodstream. The bioavailable testosterone is right down where the rubber hits the road. The testosterone concentration that presents the androgen receptor closely approximates the sum of the free testosterone, and that which is loosely bound are the carrier proteins of blood, primarily albumin. That's the one that we value the most. So... A little bit about laboratory reference ranges. How do we get normal range for testosterone? It's found through purely statistical means. It has absolutely nothing to do with health and happiness. They bookend two standard deviations across the population. When we look at the numbers, we find that about half the guys at the age of 50 have low testosterone. So basically, a large part of the population, which we're drawing our numbers, is sick. Now, I wouldn't draw a potassium level on a kidney dialysis patient on the way in for the treatment and add that in to normal range for potassium. But that's basically what we do with testosterone. There's one study I'm presenting here for you. Um, basically shows that uh, the men in the, in the lowest quartile, in other words, their normal range, but in the lowest quartile normal range, were 41% more likely to die in the 10-year span, which they watched in this particular study. You know why guys with low testosterone, even low normal testosterone, die about 10 years earlier? Or they want to. <laughs> Common sense principle. If your testosterone, total testosterone, comes at 500, and the range goes from 250 to 1,000, they're not mid-range. They're one-third up from the bottom. Some more common sense. The top of normal range for one laboratory is equal to the top of normal range for another. 
Some labs, the top range goes to 827, others to 1500. You think about it, it's the same patient population. So this is just their laboratory methodology. So the way you think about that, if you're going back and forth between different labs, and sometimes you may have to, is that you look where they are within their given range. Uh, just a quick slide here. You want to use a plain red top tube, no serum separator tubes. It's important. Sometimes you've got to add that in because I don't know. Okay. We're going to talk a lot about estrogen testing today. When I'm training physicians in my office one-on-one, -on -one, it amazes me how few doctors were even looking to assess estrogen or sex hormone binding globulin. We're going to talk about sex hormone binding globulin a lot today because it's the centerpiece of the hormone evaluation. But um, the total, test, total estrogen and the standard estradiol assays that we're used to using are not valid for adult males. And that is because, pardon me, the bottom of normal range for, for women is, a top, is the top of normal range for men. So you want that bell curve, in all laboratory testing is about the bell curve, you want your, your range to be where the slope is steep, positive or negative. So we're at the flat portion, the plateau, of the bell curve for guys. And that's not where you want to be for accurate testing. So you have to use enhanced sensitivity estrogen testing if you're going to properly assess estrogen in adult males. The standard estradiol and standard estrogen assays, which are designed for adult women, therefore greatly overestimate the estrogen of a man. And then if you're using ramitase inhibition, then you're inappropriately adding it to a man who, did, man who did not have high estrogen to start with, so you tank his estrogen. And that's bad for him to talk about that more later. So. Also, as with testosterone, you always have to be mindful of your sex hormone binding globin level. We're going to talk about that, too. So, for everybody, I put the codes that we use here, the tests that I like, and they're in your download that you can get from AMG. Uh, LabCorp is a new one out. That's a liquid chromatography, dual mass spec. It's more than their RAA, but um, a real mass assay is, is falling by the wayside. Um, the uh, liquid chromatography, dual mass spec is the way to go. And the Mayo Clinic, if they farm out the hospital, for instance, where the patient has to go, draws labs, or buy their insurance, farms out to Mayo Clinic, that's a code we use for the enhanced estradiol from them. I like that one, too. So, but they're all good. So um, I do a lot of urine testing. I hope you appreciate the, uh, the color of the uh, typeset there. Uh, I like the 24 urine test, not a spot urine. That really is of no value. The advantage of having urine testing is that we, get, we can get the metabolites. We'll talk about that a little bit, too. Um, for phase one and phase two de detoxification principles, but uh, get the metabolites. But if you're going to get 24 urine testing, which I love, because 24 urines collect all the testosterone for the whole day. Everybody knows that testosterone production is quite pulsatile. So if you're grabbing a, a serum level, it's a roller coaster. You don't know where you are in that roller coaster when you're getting a little snapshot. If you get a 24 hour urine, you're getting the area under the curve. So I love them. But you need to get a total testosterone and a sexual and binding globulin on serums to go along with it because that's where you kind of set your range where you're going to be with it. As sexual and binding globulin goes up and down, that really changes your 24-hour urine panel.